hundreds of personal appearances, his style of humor has made thousands laugh. And his numerous television appearances have broadcast his humor to millions of viewers. Tonight, he's thrilled to share his comedy with you. Please enjoy and give a warm welcome to the hilarious comedy of Steve Bruder. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's very, very nice to be here. A uh, little bit difficult getting here, I have to admit. Coming down the freeway, I saw the funniest thing. Saw this huge trailer carrying half a house. Wow. That is a tough divorce. <laughs> I hope they don't have a dog. <laughs> Feeling pretty good. This is a fun gig for me. I play a few fun gigs every now and again. A couple weeks ago, but in fact, about a week a month, I play cruise ship. Anybody ever been on a cruise? Oh, a couple people. How nice. I always love a cruise, except for that first day. That's where they get everybody on the ship, and then the first thing they do is have a lifeboat drill. Welcome aboard, prepare to die. <laughs> they don't stop scaring you there. They dress you up in those fancy life jackets, right? What color are those? Orange. orange. Bright orange, same color as a fishing lure. <laughs> well, there's some incentive to make it to the lifeboat. You're not on a little boat. The big boat goes down. That means you're dressed as bait. <laughs> you are nothing but a bobber. Give that little shark a tuned whistle. Wee, wee, here, sharky, 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 sharky. <laughs> well, I was on one ship, they put a light on there, apparently, so if you sink at night, the shark can find you. They think of everything. <laughs> I walked into my room, the first time I was ever on a ship, the life jacket was just sitting on the bed. My goodness. Why don't you just give your rosary beads and a do-it-yourself will? You want to know what scared the heck out of me? My life jacket was damp. That'll scare you. Well, no, what the heck? I'm not sure. They throw the last guy overboard. I always love how they name every single deck when you're on a ship. They've got the promenade deck. They've got the pool deck. Let me tell you something right now. If the, one of those big suckers that I'm on ever goes down, whatever deck I'm on is going to be the poop deck. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> there are not a lot of sports where you drink heavily and then try to do better. It's not like a bunch of guys are going to finish off a fifth of Jack Daniels and try skydiving. <laughs> Unless they invite that designated puller. <laughs> not that I would ever go parachuting anyway. I figured out a long time ago the first part of parachute is parish. <laughs> I guess if it doesn't open, that's where shoot comes in. <laughs> The only sport that I've ever found where you could drink as much as you want and you are guaranteed to do better, that would have to be bowling. The last time I went bowling, had a few beers, drastically improved my score because it is a hell of a lot easier knocking down 10 pins when you're looking at 20. <laughs> I've stayed in some very nice hotels in my day. I have. I've seen one of the most expensive hotel rooms in the entire world. I played the Atlantis Hotel Casino once. There, they have a room that is $25,000 a night. Wow. But for $25,000, you get the highest class of service in the entire world. As an example, for $25,000, every person that stays in this room gets three maids. And the guy behind me said, oh, 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 oh. for $25,000, those three maids better make the bed and then get in it. <laughs> <laughs> hotels are always kind of funny. The last hotel I stayed in was in Florida. It was a very nice hotel, but I believe that the hotel chain might have been catering to a dumber class of people. The hot tub had a sign on it that said, no diving. I don't think we need that sign. <laughs> Seems to me the people that want to dive in the hot tub should be allowed to dive in the hot tub. <laughs> this is how we thin the herd. <laughs> Weed out the gene pool. This is a great job being a comedian. When it works well, it's probably one of the best jobs in the entire world. And I know there are tough jobs out there. 
I saw a western not too long ago, one of these things where the cavalry comes in to save the day. I realized one of the hardest jobs in the entire world had to be the bugler in the cavalry because he led every single charge in the battle. If there's anything you don't want to be, it's a target making noise. <laughs> He's just leading his friends right into the fray, playing his little tune. Do -do -do -do. Do -do -do -do. What were the words of this song? I'm over here. <laughs> Without a gun, shoot me first. This isn't fun. And we had a lot of musical instruments leading the charge into battle. The Scottish army, they had the bagpipe player. To, hurry, hurry, hurry. He was definitely shot first. <laughs> Sometimes in the back by his own men stumped that annoying racket. I got a headache, there's a war on. Tough jobs are everywhere. I think it's especially a tough job uh, for airline pilots. I fly a lot as a comedian. I think it's definitely a tough job for American Airlines. They have the worst slogan I've ever heard of. It's American Airlines, we go that extra mile. I don't want to be sitting in the middle of a wheat field somewhere. Hey, 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 I think the airport's back that way. You missed it by a mile. Uh, I don't mean to complain, but that is a hell of a hike to baggage claim. <laughs> I'm going to have to take Southwest from here to there. I better get a frequent walker mile for this. <laughs> it's not really the length of time of the flight that ever bothers me. What bothers me is the entire flight, the pilot will just not stop talking. Anybody care how high they fly? <laughs> oh, but 10 minutes every flight you ever been on, always hear the same announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, as your captain speaking, we've reached cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. Who cares? As long as we're above zero. <laughs> See, I think if the pilot's going to say something, it should have to be exciting. From the very beginning of the flight, the most exciting thing you ever heard in your entire life. Ladies and gentlemen, as your captain speaking, we're not cleared for takeoff, but we're going for it anyway. <laughs> Let's get there early for a change. <laughs> Make it exciting. Not we've reached cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. How exciting is that? Make it exciting. We've reached cruising altitude of 12 feet. <laughs> We're going to scare the heck of those kids on that bus. Wave to them. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Uh, flying out here, I got bumped up to first class. That's always a treat. Let me just tell you right away, if you ever get a chance to do first class, it's fantastic. If the airline ever asks you to do anything, do it for them, because sometimes they'll bump you up. I got bumped up. I forgot how great first class was, because first of all, you are the first people on the airplane. It's like the pilots, the flight attendants, and then you, and you're just sitting there, and you're just like, oh, this is great, because apparently you get sat first because you need a good chair to watch the poor people parade. <laughs> I pay attention to no one when I'm on an airplane, because nothing anybody says once I'm already on the plane is going to help me out in an emergency. Like the flight attendant, she gives her a little safety speech. Like that's going to help us. I'm sorry, if we crash from 35,000 feet, there's going to be a couple exits she didn't really count on. <laughs> and we crash into water, I'm using her as a flotation device. <laughs> In case of an unscheduled landing, please file out in an orderly fashion. <laughs> and I remember thinking, did you not see us trying to get on the plane? <laughs> we couldn't manage to get on the plane in an orderly fashion. We boarded this sucker like it was the last chopper out of Saigon. <laughs> and now you're going to factor death into the equation. The best I can possibly do, trample people in an orderly fashion <laughs> as I'm fleeing the burning plane. And let me just compliment you right there that I'm actually playing to an audience that knows what the last chopper out of Saigon means. So good for you. All right. <laughs> Happy to actually hear that. Sometimes that just goes right over everybody's head. I appreciate that. 
I don't smoke myself, but I fly a lot, and I think we should still have separate sections on an airplane. Not smoking and non-smoking, just something to get the smokers away from the non-smokers. Maybe like fidgeting and non-fidgeting sections. <laughs> that way for even like the flight out here, I wouldn't have to, I, even though I was in first class, I had to sit next to Mr. Fidgety, who's being forced to quit. And if you're anywhere for somebody for four hours that is forced to quit smoking, you have to know it is going to be the longest flight of your entire life. The entire time, the per you know I can't smoke. <laughs> you didn't bring a pencil I could chew on? Maybe an ashtray I could lick or anything like that? Because, man, I'm having a bad day. I've already swallowed my patch. It didn't work on the outside. I thought maybe if I chewed it up, it'd work as gum. But no, it didn't. They... They actually said that airlines were losing money because smokers were not flying. Well, I thought the solution here was very simple. We should still have a smoking section. It should just be smaller, like one seat. <laughs> then, to make the big money, don't sell that seat <laughs> until you're about two hours into the flight. <laughs> then just have an auction. How much is that smoke worth to you? 10,000 right here, 10,000. I'll pay 5,000, let me sit next to winter, blow it in my face, big guy, come on. Because I'm for non-smoke. We know it's not good for you, but if, it's, if that's your habit, boy, you got to know that is a tough habit to break. In fact, personally, I think they've gone crazy with this non-smoking campaign. It's like in California, they outlawed smoking everywhere to you just about ex outside of your own l little house. They, they, the first place they did it was the post office. Oh, yeah, the brilliant move. Here's a place we need people to be just that much more on edge. <laughs> Some of us know the post office hasn't always been the safest place in the entire world. In fact, it's the only place you'll ever see the FBI's most wanted list look exactly like employee of the month. <laughs> I, last time I went to a fast food restaurant, they made me pour my own Coke. Just walked in, asked the guy for a Coke, he just handed me a cup. <laughs> this must be a Diet Coke. <laughs> then he said, did you want fries with that? And I said, um, not if you're going to give me a knife and a potato. <laughs> <laughs> we even have funny names for fast food restaurants. We got one in Los Angeles. I don't know if you have it here. We have one in Los Angeles called El Pollo Loco. Anybody know what that means? Yeah, the crazy chicken, which is hilarious to a comedian because you're never going to find a restaurant called the Mad Cow. <laughs> and I saw all the nice food that was out there. That's always kind of nice because left on our own, we will buy the goofiest foods. I bought a box of croutons not too long ago, got them home, found out all the croutons are kept in a stay fresh pouch. Croutons or stale bread. <laughs> we left these open all night. They would only get better. <laughs> Nobody's ever had to go back to the store with a box of croutons. Excuse me, I need some money back. These going fresh. <laughs> some foods I am never going to eat. I'm never even going to try. Like one, uh, uh, pickled pigs each one. Tongue is another one. Who had the ambition to sell tongue? Was a guy just like chewing away on a sandwich one day? Just, ow. Mmm. I mean, no, with a little mustard, that'd be pretty tasty. That'd be some good eating there. Now, people in Los Angeles actually get mad at you if you buy the wrong food. I didn't even know there was such a thing as wrong food to buy. I'm in the grocery store. I happen to be buying tuna. Lady behind me just went crazy. Just, hey. Hey, 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 you're not supposed to be buying tuna. They're catching on dolphins in the net. And I said, well, hey, 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 hey. You know, they're catching a heck of a lot of tuna. In case you missed that. And she got irate and said, excuse me, dolphins are smart. I said, well, excuse me, but I don't think we're catching the smart ones. And don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-dolphin, I'm just pro-tuna. <laughs> a couple days ago, I came up with the Bruner tax plan. And this is the idea where I think you should be taxed 
according to how rich you act. <laughs> Let me explain how this works. Right now, we fill out a whole bunch of paperwork. We send it into the IRS. They tell us how much money to send them. We usually send it to them. We hope they don't ask for more. We don't argue. Now, with the Bruner tax plan, all you have to do is answer one simple question. And how you answer that question determines your tax rate. So, an example, year one of the Bruner tax plan, they bring you into a little room and they say, you have a salad and you put a red thing on that salad. What do you call that red thing? And the people that say tomato, they pay 20%. And the people that say tomato, <laughs> they pay 30%. <laughs> and the people that say mater, they pay 5%. Okay, that joke might, I think you're applauding because you guys are in the 5% range. Okay, all right, I'm just saying. That's possible. Year number two, they bring you into a little room. They have to change up the questions. Year number two, they bring you into a little room and they say, you have a bagel. What do you put on it? And the people that say the finest salmon and the best cream cheese, 30%. The people that say butter and jam, 20%. And the people that say, if I had a bagel, I'd put on a leash, they pay 5%. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, don't explain it. You're raising his tax bracket. That's not very nice. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Year number three, they bring you into a little room and they say, what is your favorite vegetable? And the people that say braised broccoli and a white truffle sauce, 30%. The people that say snow peas, 20%. And the people that say ketchup. <laughs> it's made of maters. <laughs> I only have four years of this plan. Bigger brains than me got to put it into place. I only got one presidential term. But year number four, they bring you into the little room and they say, what do you call your father's sister? And the people that say aunt, 30%. And the people say aunt, 20%. And the people say mom. <laughs> Well, they get a rebate. <laughs> That's the Bruner tax plan. There you go. You heard it here first. I, I love traveling around the country. I think one of the funnest, uh, most enjoyable things about traveling around the country, I get to see different commercials. Last night, I think you guys got to be very proud of yourselves because you have a product I think everybody should buy. It's amazing, called the Debbie Meyer Green Bag. That is just fantastic. If you, if you haven't seen this, everybody ought to go out and buy it. What it is, you have a Debbie Meyer Green Bag, and you have a banana. You put the banana in the Debbie Meyer green bag six months later that banana is still good wow I am no longer worried about growing old I'm sleeping in the Debbie Meyer green bag <laughs> not only that there's a fantastic commercial out we've got to be proud of ourselves we have reached a level. humanity has reached a level of metallurgy where we have come up with a metal when it's honed perfectly it is so sharp and so durable that they put it into a razor blade, a razor blade that apparently is called the Infinity Razor. And the big selling point is that if you buy this razor blade, it's so sharp and so durable, never have to buy another razor as long as you live. Get this, so sharp, so durable, never buy a razor your entire life. And if you order now, we'll send you two. Oh, and just uh, honestly, so nice to uh, be here, play to adults. That's always a joy. Because left on our own, I, I, it's kind of funny, just kids add a whole new perspective to everything. I knew this just from flying in. The pilot said something about there's going to be turbulence upon landing. All the adults are like hanging on. What's that mean? I don't know. It doesn't sound good. Little girl about four years old, about five rows up, is going, whee! That is the secret to life. The next time you're in a real frustrating situation, right in the middle of your frustration, just break that. Whee! I think it'll help you. Let's say you're at the doctor's office, one of those serious doctor exams where he says that stupid thing, like bend over and relax. As soon as he says it, just whee! Hell, give him something to worry about. 
And I talk about what an easy job I have uh, being a comedian, uh, especially on a night like this where everybody's laughing at the right points. I appreciate that. I know the toughest job of all time. That would have to be parents. There's a tough job. Dang easy job to get, though. <laughs> I think most people love the interview. <laughs> you don't have to dress for it. Parents are actually kind of silly when they start out. Otherwise, they wouldn't say such dumb things to their kids like, don't you get smart? <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for setting goals I can reach. <laughs> then they say they're teaching us by example. Then they'll go, that'll teach you not to hit your brother. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm not getting smart. Parents are hilarious. You get your sense of humor from your parents, most of us, I think. I, I definitely get it from my, my mom would laugh at every single joke I ever played on her right before she beat the heck out of me. <laughs> Always in that order, too. That little laugh was a dead giveaway that you were going to get it. I remember walking in the house and I was six years old, having my mom say, don't slam the door. And I don't want to have to tell you twice. I, of course, said, What? She said, don't slam the door. And I don't want to have to tell you. <laughs> don't run from me. <laughs> if anybody's mom ever said, don't run from me, we all know that was the starter's gun. <laughs> My dad's still funny. I took him to the DMV. I don't know if in this state you have to actually take an eye test at the DMV to keep your driver's license. I don't know. My dad's 80 years old. I took him to the DMV, had to take the eye test there in front of somebody. He's about ready to read line three on the eye chart. He turned to the lady and said, you know, I don't drive like this. <laughs> oh, Dad, that's, that's funny. I'm getting you a Happy Meal. That's hilarious. <laughs> so I was talking about... I was talking about the last cruise I was on. I actually had fun for seven days. I sat at the same table with the same bunch of people, and it was hilarious because at the table, there was a couple that had just been married. They were married about 50 hours at the start of the cruise, and then I sat right next to a couple that was married a little over 50 years. And the entire, the entire cruise, the older couple, was given the younger couple marriage advice. And it was hilarious. Like the older man said, remember, marriage is like paint it colors your world <laughs> not only that it's volatile and toxic <laughs> gotta remember that that's very important <laughs> of course the older woman gave the younger man even funnier advice young man there's only two things you're ever going to argue about in this marriage that's money and sex and he said oh don't worry ma'am she doesn't make me pay <laughs> And the older man said, just wait. <laughs> and I understand why the older couple was giving the younger couple marriage advice, because classically it said, they say that the first year is the most difficult. I didn't think that was true. I thought engagement was a lot tougher than the first year, because people lie to guys about the engagement process. My whole life, people were telling me things like, diamonds are forever. <laughs> Payments are forever. <laughs> I found out fiancé is just one end short of finance. <laughs> Which is why women are in charge of the wedding. They have a more romantic vision of what it takes to put a wedding together. That's what women want. Romance and extravagance. And I know all about these two because I married a Catholic gal. So yeah, some of us know, uh-huh. It was one of those long religious stand-up, sit-down, fight, fight, fight kind of weddings, right? <laughs> I'm not Catholic myself, so my entire side of the family was totally out of shape for this thing. <laughs> Ten minutes into it, completely winded. <laughs> okay, we'll convert. Just let us sit on these cushy knee pads. Right? Any chance of them passing out that wine again? That would really help us out. We missed it the first time. Thought it was a secret handshake deal. Didn't know how to get in the club. The camera pans. It's like her half is crying. My half is smearing on Ben Gay. <laughs> Grandma, you stay down there. We'll lube you at halftime. <laughs> Somebody get a banana for Grandma. She's cramping. Come on. I think I've got one in that Debbie Meyer green bag. Help me out. Because <laughs> it was a long wedding, people. We not only lit candles, we made them. 
Now, if you're Catholic, I'm not disparaging your religion. Heck, if you're Catholic, you know what a beautiful ceremony it is. And if you're not Catholic, I'm not discouraging you from ever going to a Catholic wedding. You get invited, go. Just stretch first. That's key. Because <laughs> Catholics treat it like it is a sporting event. You knew it was going to be a long wedding because the smart Catholics brought snacks. <laughs> My family had to buy from the vendors. <laughs> Guys are the lucky ones when it comes to the honeymoon. My wife is in a different sexy outfit every 10 minutes for a two-week period of time. Watch out, fellas. That's how they hook you. It's satin for the honeymoon, then suddenly it's flannel till death do you part. I don't know what bride magazine ever stabbed this guy's in that. Oh, yeah, girls, I had about eight or nine days to go back to wearing that really sexy granny nightgown tube sock arrangement. A, woo, come to bed, my little Beverly Hillbillies woman. Oh, no, don't shave the legs. Put on the mud mask. Wear the curlers. Complete that fancy ensemble. Because I'll be honest with you, for two weeks, it was like living in a Fredericks of Hollywood. And after that, it was like living with Frederick. <laughs> And to finish up here, I don't know anything about marriage. Uh, most of you know a heck of a lot more than I do. But I do know whatever relationship you're in, you got to keep romance alive. Took me two weeks of the honeymoon to figure out something romantic to do. I had seen the movie Ten. I knew the most romantic music to make love to was Bolero. So I went out and got Bolero. Found out that is way too long of a song. <laughs> After two weeks, I just put in Pop Goes the Weasel. <laughs> you guys have been delightful. Thanks for being here. I've been Steve Bruner, and you've been a blast. Thank you very, very much.